Hi team, Justin Zeltzer here from zstatistics.com with an extended look at the statistical concept of the mean. Now, I've started referring to the mean as the cheeseburger of descriptive stats in that while it's pretty plain, ultimately it's very dependable. But if you think you know all about the mean and you're about to skip this video, I'd suggest not because there's some interesting stuff I do here looking at things like geometric means, harmonic means, and I also offer you a, a pretty difficult challenge question. I tried to think of it, a t the toughest question I could about uh, the mean. And I came up with something that I think you might find quite challenging. And I'm going to pose it to you to put your answers in the comments. So even if you think you're an expert on the mean and you know how to add things up and divide by n, come with me on a little journey here. And you might find some stuff quite interesting. Now, the earliest reference to the word mean comes from the 1300s, from the French. I'm going to guess that's pronounced mean. But someone that's French could tell me it's just pronounced mean, maybe. I don't know. But it's a term that's been around for a long time. And initially, it was used to describe the middle point in between two musical notes. And we'll see that pops up a bit later when we talk about harmonic means. Anyway, the basics are pretty straightforward. Now, I'm going to first throw some formula and symbols at you, and then we'll try to find, then we'll try to calculate a mean from an actual sample. But in statistics, we have this pronumeral, x bar, which we use to describe a sample's mean. And to calculate the sample's mean, it's going to be the sum of x. This big Greek symbol here, sigma, indicates that we are to sum this particular variable. And then we divide by the number of observations, which is n. And in doing so, we calculate x bar. And that provides us an estimate of this Greek letter mu, which represents the population mean. So that's the whole principle behind statistics. We have a sample. We can create a statistic from that sample. In this case, a sample mean. And that sample mean is an estimate of the true unknowable population mean. So for example, if we're to find the average height of professional basketball players using this following random sample, you can see we have five players in our sample, each of their heights given here. And we can use that formula, fairly straightforward, sum everything up, divide by five, and we find that the average height in the sample, x bar, is 2.032. Now the point I was making above here when I say it's an estimate of mu is to say that this is our best guess now as to the true average height of professional basketball players. They seem to be on average 2.03 meters tall, which is bloody tall. But appreciate that this is actually an arithmetic mean. We've just called it a mean so far, but there are other types of means that we're about to be introduced to. And this one where we just add up all the observations and divide by n, is called the arithmetic mean. So let's have a look at some of the other types of means. So here's our arithmetic mean again. There's also something called a geometric mean, which unlike the arithmetic mean, you actually need to find the product of all the observations in the sample and then take the nth root of that product. And we'll see how that works in just a second. A harmonic mean is quite interesting too. What you do there is you actually invert all the observations. You can see we've got one on x here. All those are being summed together. You invert all of the observations, then find the average of all the inverted observations. And finally, you invert back that average. But look, in reality, you're going to be dealing with the arithmetic mean 99% of the time. But in certain circumstances, these do pop up. And they're actually more interesting, if you ask me. Hence why I'd like to focus on them. So let's have a look. What's a geometric mean? Now this example will show you where the geometric mean actually gets its name from. Geometry, funnily enough. A rectangle has dimensions 9 meters by 4 meters. It's a pretty big rectangle. What's the side length of a square with equivalent area? So here's that rectangle, 4 by 9. Quite clearly, we know that the area is going to be 4 times 9, which is 36 meters squared. So the question is, what square has an area of 36 meters squared? 
And you could probably tell me just from your own knowledge that the side length needs to be six meters. So in this case, six is actually going to be the geometric mean of four and nine. But if you're to use the formula, the formula tells us to take the nth root of the product of the two observations. So four times nine, we're gonna multiply that together. We're then gonna take the square root because there's only two observations. So the nth root becomes the square root. And the square root of 36 happens to be six. So that's where the geometric mean gets its name. But the applications extend well beyond geometry. My Tesla stocks gain 10% in year one. My theoretical Tesla stocks, that is. 20% in year two and 30% in year three. What's the average yearly rate of return? Now, this is a classic example of where geometric means come into the picture when you're dealing with rates of return. So here's a visualization of what's going on. In year zero, we have $100, let's just say. I've just put that in. It could have been any number of dollars here, but I've just chosen a nice round number. If I'm to gain 10% in that first year, that's going to take me to $110. To gain 20% in that second year, well, it's 20% of 110, which gets added on. So that's going to get me to 132. And then to add 30% on to the end of year three will get us to $171.60. But essentially what's happened here is I've multiplied by 1.1 in the first instance, 1.2 in the second instance, and 1.3 in the third instance. So you can see here that we have a changing yearly rate of return over the three years. But what the question's kind of asking is, can we find a yearly rate of return which is the same for each of these three years and still gets us to $171.60? Now, the reason why this is a geometrical problem is that if you think about a rectangular prism where the dimensions are 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3 respectively, we can ask, what is the side length of a cube that has the same volume? And that's exactly the same question. So even though this is a financial question here, there's this geometrical analogy, which is why this is a geometric mean. So how do we do this? Well, we know that multiplying these together, 1.1 times 1.2 times 1.3 gives us 1.716. So that is the multiplier that gets us from year zero to year three. And you can see that represented here, which geometrically would be our volume, right? Now, what we have to do is take the cubed root of 1.716, and that will give us the effective average yearly rate of return. So the geometric mean, I've provided it again here, is the nth root of the product of X. That symbol there is the Greek letter pi, which tells us to multiply all the elements of x. So it's going to be the cubed root of 1.716, which happens to be 1.1972. So in other words, if you needed to get from $100 to $171.60 in three years, you could multiply by 1.1972 three times. That means that our average yearly rate of return is 19.72%. You can lop off that first one point and have a look at just the increase, which is 19.72%. So let's have a look now at harmonic means. Now, harmonic means are used predominantly when you're dealing with rates. And one of the more common rates that you'll come across is that of speed, which is the rate of distance over time. So here's a little example. If I say I swim one minute of freestyle at three kilometers an hour and then one minute of breaststroke at two kilometers an hour, what's my average speed? You'd be able to tell me that almost straight away that my average speed is 2.5 kilometers an hour. Why is that? Well, we can see the two speeds here and they're given as distances over time and we're averaging out across a single unit of time in each case, right? So when you've got a rate of distance over time and you're finding the average across fixed time, then the answer can be provided by finding the arithmetic mean, just simply adding things up and dividing by n, which in this case is two. 
But what if I asked you this? I swim one lap of freestyle at three kilometers an hour and then one lap of breaststroke at two kilometers an hour. What's my average speed now? Well, this is no longer just an arithmetic mean and hopefully you can see why. Clearly, my lap that I do at three kilometers an hour will be done faster than my lap that I do at two kilometers an hour. So if you look at the total time I'm spending swimming here, I'm spending more time swimming at two kilometers an hour than I am swimming at three kilometers an hour. So the average speed's no longer gonna be just 2.5 kilometers. It's gonna to have to be the harmonic mean of both two and three. So whenever you have a rate like this, distance over time, if you're trying to find the average across a fixed distance, which is the numerator of the rate, the solution will be a harmonic mean. So let's indeed find out how that gets calculated. Now I'm just repeating that harmonic mean question up here where we've got a lap of freestyle and a lap of breaststroke. So here's the formula to find the harmonic mean. It's n divided by the sum of one on x. But I've reconfigured it here just to show you what really is happening here. We have the sum of one on x divided by n. So the average of the inverted observations and then taking the inverse of that. So it's almost like we flip it over, find the average and then flip it back. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because we need to find the average across this fixed distance. So we need to flip these rates so they're no longer distance over time, but rather time over distance. And then of course we need to flip it back once we find that average. So here it is using that formula. Instead of three plus two, divided by two, we now have one on three plus one on two divided by two, and then we invert that. And so using a little bit of algebra here, which hopefully you're up to, it's gonna be two divided by five on six, which turns out to be 2.4. So my average speed here is 2.4 kilometers per hour. And you'll notice that it is slightly closer to two than it is to three. And that's kind of what we expected, right? Because we're swimming at two kilometers an hour for slightly longer than we're swimming at three kilometers an hour because of the fixed distance. Now, if you're interested in knowing why it's called a harmonic mean, I've just prepared a little kind of aside here just in case you wanted to know for anyone that's uh, interested. It indeed comes from the word harmony from music and I'll try to do this quite quickly, but the idea is that whenever you have a particular musical note, let's say the note A, let's just say this particular A has a frequency which is 110 hertz. Not only when I hit that string does this frequency sound wave get emanated, but there are all these other harmonic overtones that also emanate from that particular strike of that string. So I'll get 110 hertz, as the frequency that comes out, but I'll also get 220, a little bit of 330, a little bit less of 440, etc., etc. And these are called harmonic overtones. Now we don't need to get into the musicality of all this, but appreciate if you've done any science, you remember that wavelength is actually proportional to the inverse of these frequencies. So if you call the wavelength one for this frequency 110 hertz, the wavelength for 220 hertz will be half of that and the wavelength of 330 hertz will be a third of the original wavelength. So what happens is that, is that these wavelengths are in fact in a harmonic series so that the harmonic mean of this wavelength, one on two, and this wavelength, one on four, is actually one on three. So you can see it's because of this whole inverting that happens between frequency and wavelength that to find the average of a particular of two particular wavelengths, you need to find the harmonic average or the harmonic mean. Now I'm going to leave you with a challenge question, which I'm not going to answer myself, but I'm hoping you will provide your answers in the comments. But as you can see, it's all about Eddie Merckx and his morning cycle. So I'll leave that with you. My name is Justin Zeltzer from Z Statistics. Dot com. You can see all my videos up there. Or alternatively, just click the link to go to the next video in the series on descriptive stats. See you around.